I'd like you to take your Bibles. We're going over to the New Testament this morning, 2 Peter chapter 3, starting in verse 10. I'm going to go to verse 9, actually. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. This is an interesting portion of scripture. We think that because it seems like God doesn't deal with sin in our lives or in the sin of a nation or of a world, that everything just continues to go on as it always did. So we stop and think about that, and we say, well, I guess God doesn't care. He's not going to do anything because of the sin we commit. That's not true. You see, his slowness is different than our slowness, and that's why he's telling us here. Instead, he is patient with you. That means me too. He is patient with us, not wanting anyone to perish. You see, the Lord does not want anyone to die and go to hell. He wants them all to come to know Christ as their personal Savior, to repent of their sin, and to ask them to come into his heart and, and to save them from themselves not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with the roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything uh, done in it will be laid bare. That's scary stuff, folks. That's what's going to happen to the world. But, you know, praise God, praise God, praise God. We're going to be with him. The tribulation will have come, and you and I are not going to be a part of that. Oh, we might have some of the uh, the beginning things of that taking place that we might experience, but certainly not the horrid time of the tribulation. We will not be here. We will be raptured. We will be meeting the Lord in the air. That's what he promises you and I here today. We've been in a series of messages that I titled several weeks ago that they haven't seen what we have seen. They have not seen what we have seen. And that's right. No previous generation has seen any of these prophecies come true in their lifetime. We are seeing those things today, folks. They have not seen what we are seeing right now. Theologians and preachers have listed anywhere from 7 to 16 different prophecies they believe have come to pass during our generation. I believe we're living in the last days. I really do. I also believe we're living in the days just before the tribulation and the rapture of the church. This morning we are literally bringing this series to an end. And that's where we are going to be this morning. The end of what is taking place all around us. The question that I want to present to you, though, is this. Are you what? Ready. Ready. Are you ready? You need to ask yourself that several times during this message. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 through 17 gives us a, a pretty clear picture as to what's going to be taking place while we're in heaven to be with the Lord. I want you to see what is in store with this world that we live in. Claudia, can you show those pictures? The first one happens to be the the insects and things that are going to 
take these trees with the blossoms and they're going to become bare. They're going to become bare. And then the famine. Look at how skinny they are, bones. That's what's going to be happening in the tribulation. The possible atomic bombs. Think of that. We have this taking place today if Putin wants to go ahead and destroy part of the world. That guy's nuts. But guess what? God knows all about it. And he's going to take care of the born-again Christian. You're not going to be a part of any of that. But that's where part of the fire will take place. How about war? Isn't that awful? War. And rumors of wars. And then how about that fire? Everything is going to be destroyed, folks. Everything in the world is going to be destroyed by fire. Now, I want to expand upon that just a little bit. As you look at these terrifying pictures, and as you read 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 17, you're going to find Peter giving us three different pictures of the world. And we're living in the second picture that Peter gives us. But I want to back up just a little bit and talk to you about that first picture because it is essential to the second and the third picture. Verses 5 and 6 of Second Peter, if you want to take a look there. <clears throat> but they deliberately forget my goodness, they deliberately forget that long ago by God's word the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. And these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. Huh. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire. Excuse me. Everything that we read in those verses is in the past tense. In other words, they've already happened. They've already taken place. The word that existed in the world back then, Peter says, it perished. The world perished. It says here in the NIV that it was destroyed. The world was destroyed. Verse 6, what kind of world existed back then? Well, think about it. The key to the future, folks, is found in the past. And if you want to know what the future holds, you will want to understand the past. And if you want to know what's going on in the future, you need to go back to the beginning. It's hard to know that there are wonderful things happening in our lives if we don't have some bad things happening in our lives. Oh, we don't want that. But that's the way it is in this human life that we live. The bad things make glorification of the good things. That's what the Lord Jesus has done for us. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, and you need to understand this verse. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It was God who created all of this. The past world was created by God, and Peter says here, that even the people in the world at that time scoffed at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that was 2,000 plus years difference from Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. Those who didn't believe in Jesus and his coming again, 
those who are skeptical about their faith are people who are willingly, that's what the Bible says, willingly ignorant of the fact that God created the heavens and the earth. What do you believe? Do you believe that God is the creator of all things? That's what he tells us. We believe it by faith, believing in him. Why do people believe in evolution? Evolution is not much of a science that it claims to be, but it is more of a philosophy of life. Even evolution, folks, requires faith. It is an attitude about the beginnings of man, where he came from and where he's headed. So if people are wrong about the beginning of man, where man came from, then they will be wrong about the destiny and they will find that eternity is not theirs. So what do you believe? I hope you don't believe in evolution. I hope you understand that God created you and me. He created man and woman and children. He created them and you and me for his glory and for his honor. So if people are wrong about the beginning of man, then they're going to be wrong about their destiny. They're going to be wrong about, about eternity and where they will spend eternity. The Bible gives us a choice. Either we'll go to heaven because we trusted in Christ as our Savior. That takes faith. It takes faith. Or you can go to hell. And you can go to hell by the way that you reject the Lord Jesus Christ. You reject God's gospel, the good news in the word of God. If you deny the past history of man, you're going to have a strange picture of the future because you don't understand that you are willingly, here we go, willingly ignorant that God says anyone who wants to can understand that he created the heavens and the earth and that he created all things from that which cannot be seen. Hebrews 11, 1 and 2, it's on the screen. Now faith, there we go again. It takes faith, folks, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now, faith is being sure, to be sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed by God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Only God could do that. All these things that we see, hey, listen, it doesn't take much, much faith to believe in something we see, but it's the things that we don't see that God created as well. This world, folks, was created by God. But Peter said the past world became corrupt. It became corrupt. Second Peter 3, 6 says that humans he created became sinful by the nature of Adam and Eve that became natural to every man, woman, and child since then. If you want to look at the family tree, you can take it all the way back to Adam and Eve. That's where it all began. And it's those two who have given every person since then that has been born. It is, it is they... Uh, those two, Adam and Eve, that brought sin into your life and into mine. We are born with it. It's a natural thing for us to be sinful by our very nature. God gave a warning in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. He said, my spirit will not contend with man forever. God said... I'm not always going to be here for man. This was the past. And the formation of the world had become more corrupt as every day came by. 
Another warning was given, Genesis 6, 7. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth. Wow. That's going to be tough, folks. Disappear. Man, animals, creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air. For I am grieved. This is God. I am grieved that I have made man. A universal flood came along. It didn't just happen in the Middle East. It didn't just happen in, in Israel. It happened throughout the world. And scientists prove over and over and over again that the flood was universal. In other words, it covered the entire earth. The Bible says the key to the future is found in the past. Now listen to this. Matthew chapter 24 and verses 38 and 39. For the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Now what's wrong with getting married? Well, nothing except that in this case, God told them you don't marry outside of your Jewish people, you're, you Israelites. You don't get to marry people outside of that. They were wicked people. They were idolaters. They worshipped idols. And he said, don't marry them because then you are, you are uh, believing by faith my word. And these people over here on this side don't believe a thing that my word says. Our world is indifferent to the things of God, folks. The world could care less that Jesus died for them. Nothing changed. Remember, Noah preached for 120 years. And as he was hammering in every board to the ark, he warned everyone that a flood was coming, but they just continued in their lives the same way that they had always lived their lives. Nothing changed. He presented what was going to happen. Rain, water filling the whole world. They did not believe, and therefore they perished. Only seven people survived that universal flood. What a disaster that no one was willing to believe. Not only was there indifference, but there was immorality. People were marrying and giving in marriage. They were marrying ungodly people. The second picture is this. The first picture is the past. The second picture is where you and I are. This is the picture. Second Peter 3.3, 3, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come. People will make fun of the word of God. People will say, ah, oh, that's rubbish. Ah, oh, I'm not going to believe that. Oh, i got a whole bunch of different things people say about the word of God, if it is the word of God. That's what we see here, scoffers and following their own desires. That's what man does today. People go by this church every day. Most of them are not going to be going to church this morning when you see them going by one way or the other. How sad is that, that they don't believe the things of God's word? A scoffer makes fun of anything that has to do with God spirituality, and religion. Our world mocks anything holy. Our world mocks, first of all, the word of God. It mocks, it makes fun of the word of God. It, may, it mocks the things that God has set apart for himself. Our world mocks the church. Boy, it sure does, and it's getting worse for the fundamental uh, a church throughout the world, not just here. Our world mocks God's promises and prophecies. 
They say, well, he's, he's said that he's going to come back, and that was thousands of years ago, and he hadn't come back yet. He isn't going to come back. That's a bunch of garbage. That's rubbish. That's not going to take place. We believe it by faith, trusting in him. Our world mocks his coming again. He is going to come again, just like with the flood. You see, folks, he's already told us what's going to take place and how it's going to take place and the things that are going to happen within that tribulation time. And then with the, uh, uh, with the thousand years and then with the Lord chaining uh, Satan and throwing him into the bottomless pit, all of that comes later. His coming again is mocked by people. Salvation is mocked by people. I talk to many people, and many people turn down, turn down salvation. If you were to die right now, my friend, where would you spend eternity? Where would you go, heaven or hell? That's the only two places that he offers you. You know, if you have heaven, if you have the Lord Jesus in your heart and you've repented of your sin, heaven is your home. You've done what God wanted you to do. That's why he sent his son to die for you, to shed his blood for you, to be buried and then to be raised again on the third day. That's what that is all about. But people mock salvation. Oh, I don't need that. I, I have my way of getting to heaven. I'm a good person. I give a lot of money to the church. I pray a lot. I give to people that are poor and need, need help. I'm, I'm, I don't cuss. I don't, I don't use drugs, any of these things. That doesn't make any difference at this point, folks. It is what you do with Christ. Even the thief on the cross said, remember me when you go to be with your father in heaven. And Jesus said, but you will be with me in paradise. It was because that thief had faith in the Lord Jesus and to who he was and is for you and me today. Salvation. You have to remember that that Noah, as he told the sightseers that the world was going to be destroyed by a flood, it never flooded before. It never rained before. The, the earth was watered from underneath the ground, and it came up and it watered things that needed water. But let me tell you, folks, Jesus predicted this. God predicted this. And he's encouraging you this morning to trust in Christ as your Savior, to have faith in him. The future world, 2 Peter 3.13. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. You see, in heaven... Everything is going to be right, righteousness. It's going to be a new heaven, a new earth. Things will be totally changed from anything that any of us have ever experienced in our lifetime. That's what God has promised us, up, uh, us here. Matthew 24, verse 37, as it was in the days of Noah, the sinfulness of people, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. He's telling us what's going to happen. Hey, folks, get with it. Do what's right. Be ready for his coming. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth after you and I are taken out of this world. An evangelist put it this way. In the new heaven and new earth, there will be no pills, no ills, and no bills. There will be no funerals. There will be no sickness. There will be no death, no mass shootings, 
no guns or weapons of any kind. There won't be any police in heaven. There won't be any more armies, no wars, no hospitals, no separation from one another, no sin, no anger, no gossip. And this is just the beginning of the list of the promises that God gives to the believer. These are promises God promises us. The future world is going to be a purified world. There will be no more sin. None of the things that cause us to be angry and other things that cause us to, uh, to uh, fight other people or to gossip about other folks. Revelation 21.1 then I saw a new, there we are again, a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. God has changed the world in the future. The church, by the way, won't have any influence upon the population of the world in the future. No influence. In other words, they've all gone to social uh, kind of, of, of church, kind of like a club. Oh, you come, you join, you be a part of it, and, and good for you. That's not the way it is. Churches in the future will not be preaching and teaching the word of God. We do that. Sunday morning, Wednesday night Bible study, we do that with our our uh, life groups uh, that Bill and Janet uh, teach, those things are necessary for us as Christians to grow spiritually in the word of God. So then I saw a new heaven, new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. The church has no influence. It will be corrupted, and indeed, there are churches around here that are just corrupted. They do not go by the word of God. They might have a Bible sitting somewhere in that church facility, but they do not teach it or preach the word of God. Folks, if you're not in a church where you're being fed and where the word of God is being taught, you're wasting your time. There's no use you being a part of that. Because you're not going to grow. You're not going to learn. You're not going to know what pleases God according to the kind of a lifestyle that you have. The Bible explains that, that, that are described just like we see them today. It seems that our time to support our missionaries and reaching the world with the gospel is on a short rope. I think the last days are here. And these missionaries have a responsibility, just like I do, to preach and teach the word of God to a lost and dying world. And that's the importance of us having missionaries that we support. The Silvas are a good example of that. Even with the, with the fear of, of uh, uh, these, these uh, rioters coming their way and and breaking into their Sunday school or their uh, Christian schools and, and destroying things there and maybe even shooting the kids that are in there and the teachers. They're standing firm and they're making things as safe as they possibly can. I like what that preacher once said about you and me. This is a terminal generation. We are a terminal generation. I believe that with all my heart. In other words, folks, this is it. And what you make of it is going to depend on what happens in the future. There aren't going to be any second chances, no second choices. What you do with Christ before you die or before the Lord takes uh, the Christian up is up to you. What kind of faith do you have? 
These are the signs of the times. And as a Christian, you need to be an active participant in the last days. Birth pains are getting closer together, folks. Scripture tells us that. So, do you know Christ as your personal Savior? Have you repented of your sin and asked the Lord to forgive you and to come into your heart and to save you? Are you a born-again Christian, John chapter 3? As Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus, sure enough, Nicodemus did not understand what the Lord Jesus was saying, and yet it was simple and very clear how he could know that heaven was his home. But the question that we always come down to is this. Are you ready? Yeah. Are you ready? If it were to happen today, and it could, just like that, folks, it could happen just like that and just that quick. You don't have to wait for all the signs to be lined up to where you see them. But you can understand that they could all take place right now, right now. And all of them have come to pass, and God takes you up. If you're lost and without Christ, you need to come. Christian, let me tell you, this is the end. You hear me? This is the end. What will you do? If you were to die right now, and there's still sin in your life as a born-again Christian, all your sin from the point of your salvation on back has been forgiven, regardless of what kind of sin it was. But there are sins that you and I commit since then that need to be uh, uh, told to the Lord and confessed to him. And ask him to forgive you. Whatever your need is this morning, my friend, you need to come.